Hello, everyone. This is Aaron Saft, and thank you for joining me on the MR Running Pains podcast. Today's guest, I have Sarah Jones and Celia Eicheldinger. And Celia just finished the Fierce Dragon 200, and as we say on the podcast, 15 mile race. Um, and man, what a joyous conversation. I really thoroughly enjoyed hearing her story. Um, and you know how Sarah uh, joined her as a pacer and, and crew member. Um, this was a listener requested podcast, and I am so glad that uh, that it was requested because uh, Celia is just uh, just full of life and and wonder and and happiness, and you can hear it in her voice and uh, in her uh, retelling of her story on the Fierce Dragon. So, um, thank you, Nancy, for suggesting recording this podcast with Celia. Um, it, it truly inspiring for me. Um, these conversations often leave me, um, you know, with a lot to, to think on and to, uh, try to, um, contemplate and see how I can, you know, replicate, uh, their experiences, their joy. Um, you know, it's, it's impossible to totally replicate it, but at the same time, I hope you can take things away from it and find um, motivation, uh, inspiration, uh, even learning lessons uh, that you know that Celia took away, Sarah took away. So I really enjoyed this conversation. After our conversation, I'll catch up with you guys about everything that's going on here in the MR Running Pains world. And um, like I said, really just enjoy this conversation with Celia and Sarah. I am joined by two amazing human beings, um, Celia and Sarah. It is great to see you both. We're shiny early morning here on February 1st. <laughs> How are you both today? I'm excellent. <laughs> great, great. Um, Celia finished the Fierce Dragon, which is incredible. Um, and we'll get to get to that. And Sarah was her pacer and and did some crewing. So um, wanted to have them both on and kind of talk about the experience. Um, we talked with um, David Holliday and uh, Michael Patton. Um, and I'll post that in the show notes about Fierce Dragon. But um, this is quite the event. So <laughs> I am eager to hear this conversation. But let's get to know both of you a little bit first. Celia, why don't you uh, introduce yourself and uh, and tell us about you? Um, so I'm Celia Eicheldinger. And um... Let's see. I guess since we're talking about running, I'll, I'll focus on that. I, a, you can tell us everything. <laughs> <laughs> you know, runners, we're like, let's just talk running. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. I'm a lifelong runner. I um, decided at the age of 13 that I wanted to run. I don't know why, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> and, so I, and so I put on a pair of shoes, which I presume were running shoes. I don't even remember. And I stepped out my door and um, what's interesting about where I lived I lived in this small town and I lived on a dirt road and first she went down maybe a 10th or two tenths of a mile from my driveway, my dirt driveway. <laughs> and then you turned onto this dirt road and pretty soon it just went straight up and it did this for like three quarters of a mile. And so I told myself, all right, by the end of the summer, I'm going to run this. <laughs> <laughs> and I just started and, you know, it started with a lot of walking. <laughs> Was this in, in Georgia? Did you grow up in Georgia? No, I grew up in Pilot, Virginia, which is okay. a tiny, tiny little town close to Virginia Tech. Yep, yep, yep. In the I mountains. was in Christiansburg for a long time, so. <laughs> oh, yeah, you know exactly where I'm talking about. Yep. And so um, by the end of the summer, I finally made it to the top without stopping, which was really exciting. And, that, and it was aided by this little dog <laughs> <laughs> that was like almost at the top of this person's house. It used to come out and nip at my heels every oh, time. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, finally I outran that dog. <laughs> That was a big day. <laughs> that was a really big day. So, like, so that's how it all started. Um, and then I ran cross country and track and did all that in high school. And then from there, running just kind of became something I did for me. I ran throughout college, but not like on a team or anything like that. And um, yeah, I guess it kind of went from there. I guess my other big thing that I spend a lot of time is I'm a mom. <laughs> That's really important to me. I have two really amazing boys. I am, um, I'm so amazed at where are, they've come and what, what they do. Their, what are their ages? Oh, they're eleven and fourteen. Awesome. 
and they're they're pretty incredible. My 11 year old likes to join me on the trails and probably enjoys volunteering more than anything in his life. I mean, <laughs> if I ever decide that I want to run Baby Dragon, I will be in so much trouble because <laughs> that is the race that we spend 24 hours volunteering. And I don't know if it's that he enjoys being allowed to stay up all night. <laughs> <laughs> Or if he really, I think he really enjoys volunteering. And then my 14 year old's really into mountain biking. And actually this coming weekend, I, do you know the Georgia Jewel race? I'm sure you do. I do. Okay, so you know, you know the Rock Garden? Yes. He's going to mountain bike that. Like, oh my gosh. It blows my mind. That's his <laughs> race this coming weekend. I'm like. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Man, yeah, it takes, for a, it takes a different skill set. It. Yeah, I'm just amazed. So I'm really excited cool. for this very weekend cool. to see how that goes. That's very cool. Um, and you know, we, before we got started, uh, Sarah was mentioning that a lot of your stuff isn't on ultra sign up, which, you know, a, a lot of us, it's not, especially when we participate in some road events and such, when you were in college, is that where you found yourself like more on the roads? Well, or? um, well, I always gravitated towards trails actually. Okay. I, um, I, I ran my first trail race. It was called the Brush Mountain Breakdown. And oh, yeah. I, that's, it, I brought that back. <laughs> that it was, broke uh... me. <laughs> <laughs> I ran that in college. It was so funny. I remember I was out there with like, you know, on a trail run, there was nobody around me. And I was, that was new. And I took yeah. this huge fall, like head over feet tumbling. And I looked around and I was like, there's nobody here to make sure I'm okay. <laughs> you better get up and go. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but, but no, I think what, um, what Sarah's referring to is I've done a lot of adventure runs. Mm, okay. And yeah, yeah, over the past, and we can talk more about it if you want. Yeah, but um, yeah. for the past two years, I've been kind of run hiking the Appalachian Trail. Nice with a with another friend meg landy moore and um so we took it took us about a year and a half i I am not finished i still have sections of maine to finish up but she finished Mm -hmm. and we did we it was kind of a mix between kind of like an ultra event and a hiking event we started off wanting to make it like ultra experiences and sarah actually crewed our first attempt or our first time out and it was like i don't know 115 or 18 miles the approach Georgia and then some of North Carolina and we did it in 48 hours it was insane wow. <laughs> you know we um <laughs> we became the favorites at a shelter when we arrived at 2 a.m ripped out our emergency blankets because you know we had nothing else on us which sounded a little bit like aluminum foil <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, all the other hikers that arrived at a reasonable hour probably 8 p.m <laughs> <laughs> to a completely full shelter. I mean, we were sleeping on the picnic table. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. And making all this racket, and, <laughs> you know, trying to catch a few moments of rest before we got up at, I don't know, 5 a.m. with one of the hikers saying, what did he say? Um, Thanks for coming. <laughs> 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 but anyway, we, um, we, we did the trail. I would say our, um, our shortest weekend was a 70 mile weekend and our longest was 195. Wow. And we averaged, I would say between 40 and well, I think after our first year, our average was around 45 ish miles a day. And then, um, in the second year, we didn't want to train so hard to get (laughs) started. We took a break for the winter. We didn't want to train so hard to get started. So we did our some of our training on trail. So we started off with 30 mile days and then kind of slowly built up. But anyway, that's um, where the bulk of my experience really lies in the, the 2000 yeah. miles. Oh <laughs> when did that start? When did you start doing that? Oh, uh, so March of not this year, but the previous year. 21? Yeah. 2020? 2020? Yeah. I don't it was know. like kind of right, when COVID right, right, started? Right, right, right. Yeah, no, it was 2021. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you're right because yeah, yeah. it's easy to remember 2020. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that that probably yeah, has set you well up for for Fierce Dragon. So that's that's pretty cool. Well, actually, interestingly, that on that first segment, Sarah dropped a big old whisper in my ear when she said, "You're doing Fierce Dragon pace," and I was like, uh, "What? What?" what? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so it certainly set the stage in many ways. Gotcha. Right on. Um, so Sarah, why don't you, uh, introduce yourself? 
Um, I'm Sarah Jones. Um, I didn't start running till later in life. I was actually 32 um, when I first started running and um, just started with a little couch to 5k. And I had a buddy that I met through that and he really enjoyed trail running and I really enjoyed being out in the woods more so than anything else. So that just led me to trail running and ultimately to ultras and where I'm at today. So. <laughs> and, and how did you two meet? running yeah yeah through running um, through running um was it an event or a social group or just mutual friends i think it was one of the um runs held at athens running company i think somebody introduced us at the end of one of those runs Sarah, okay I could probably <laughs> yeah. yeah but but somehow we became like fast friends and i think it's like the shared love of being on a trail and um volunteering and supporting other people we we have all that in common i think that's what nice. well not to speak for you sarah but <laughs> i yeah. think that's what bonds us <laughs> <laughs> um celia before uh sarah whispered that sweet little nothing in your ear about fierce dragon had you heard of the event sarah had invited me to volunteer with her one winter and um i will never forget this moment it was cold it was windy and um i brought two pies for the um <laughs> runners and they seemed to really love it and i just i remember after they finished their slice of pie they were headed out the door and i thought to myself it's so dark it's so cold <laughs> it's so windy i'm so glad i'm not doing this <laughs> <laughs> little did you know we were also <laughs> stationed at Hina gap so we were we were, didn't really have much shelter from <laughs> right right yeah um which which is interesting because um there's i mean there's just it's so varied from aid station to aid station what you find you know like some of them he sets up perry sets up like you know tents with like wood burning stoves and you know it's like yeah. almost like a hut you know <laughs> and then yeah you get to something like skina and it's like a, a three-walled tent with you know just like a few cots <laughs> and well, this definitely stuff that came up for sure. Yeah. Stepped it up. yeah. 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 This year was pretty amazing, actually. It was maybe a little too cozy. <laughs> <laughs> get, easy to get yeah, stuck. Huh? Full on heated tents and oh wow. Yeah, yeah that's great. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because when Michael the, did it, I remember getting to uh uh Skeena. Yeah, it was Skeena. And you know, it's just like I said, like a three walled tent and there was nobody there, you know. Uh it yeah. wasn't it wasn't you know volunteered. There was like it was just kind of like self serve. <laughs> so it's, Oh uh, no, no. This was perfect. I mean, it was really and the volunteers were incredible, like so incredible. Yeah, yeah. it's I mean it's it's such a we'll we'll talk about the the remoteness of some of the courses and such, uh, some of the course areas, but um man, and so um Sarah, had you ever had Fierce Dragon on your radar? Something that you had ever thought about? I mean, I would say it always pops in my head. And if I were to ever attempt a 200 mile, <laughs> this one would be ideal just with the way it's set up. I mean, it's just like 40 something miles out and back. And then you're back at, you know, the main area where you could have whatever you need, um, rest, shower, mm -hmm. um, all of your stuff. So I, I volunteered there every year, except the first year. So always being there, I'm always like, oh, maybe one day. But then, <laughs> then after I leave, I'm like, oh, I don't know. I don't think I <laughs> but yeah, if I were to ever attempt one, this would definitely be the one. I love this this race. I love um, Perry and everything he does. And the course is just amazing. So God, so many, so many questions. <laughs> um, so um, I guess we should start with the the man and the myth and the legend of Perry. Um, talk a little bit about Perry and what events he put on just to kind of give everybody a fuller picture of, you know, because it, it, it seems to kind of always focus on the uh, the Duncan Ridge Trail. <laughs> I know there's yeah. there's others, but. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, yeah. So he he does H9 events. Um, and then. Most of those are at, from Vogel to Skeena, um, the Duncan Ridge, you've got the actual H9, which is more of a um, member event. That's in August, that's a 50 miler or, or a marathon. That actually uses a different trail than the Duncan Ridge. Um, 
for parts of it. He calls them ranger trails. And there's some sections where it's just like, okay, I'm just going to turn and go straight up this mountain. <laughs> and you're not even convinced there's actually a trail. You're just following flags. Um, that's probably my favorite. Um, and then he does Baby Dragon, which is the week after. That's the on the, the Duncan Ridge. So you've got your 40 miler, 100 miler. He may have added a couple other ones. Um, Fierce Dragon is basically the same course, um, but in winter. And then he does Stone Anvil, which is at Fort Mountain State Park. You have, you have to add Fierce Dragon that he does the pointless elevation change. Oh, yeah. <laughs> which yeah, is so, so soul crushing. <laughs> yes. Well, Celia, why don't you talk about the, the Fierce Dragon course? Um, I, you know, my, I guess my first question is, um, did it start this year at Vogel? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I know a lot of courses have changed because of the increase in the uh, the rate of, you know, how much the state park is charging. But that's, that's great because Vogel is so convenient, as Sarah was saying, you know, there's so much there. So, um, Celia, why don't you go ahead and just touch on the start at Vogel, talk about that, and then talk about the, the course and how it goes. What's the setup, layout, elevation change, all that good stuff. Well, so just a little bit back to Perry. Um, Perry, you know, I text a little bit and he, he likes to say that his races are um you know like racer against the mountain not racer against racer and so like that's just kind of the general philosophy i think of his races which i i really really like i am um, i'm a little more into personal competition than like outside competition and so i really really appreciate that about his races and his philosophy um fierce dragon as you noted starts from vogel and then each lap as sarah touched on finishes at vogel which it is I'm like Sarah, I would love to do another 200. I can't imagine any other 200 because the logistics are just so easy. <laughs> the course is hard for sure, but the logistics are so simple. And um, I like to be fairly detailed in my planning. I have a lot of food sensitivities, so I can't really rely so much on aid station food. And so it just having everything. And then the crew spots are so easy. So along the course, you leave out, on Vogel and you start on the Kusa back country trail and then you turn onto the DRT and then you get to skiing and then you turn around and basically repeat on the way back with the exception at the very end, you have to go on the endless road, <laughs> the road that never ends, <laughs> which is a fire road. <laughs> but I mean, there are so many accessible points for your crew and um, the fact that it's just out and back the same course was well, 43 miles according to my watch but Terry <laughs> likes to say 40 whatever <laughs> I ran 215 miles not 200 <laughs> <laughs> but all those things make the race in many ways a lot easier in my mind than some of like the loop races or the point to point or even an out and back where you would go out 100 miles and um, I really really appreciate that now of course there are little things like the pointless elevation change which you know Perry adds just as he says for the pleasure of the race director which would be him um <laughs> you're just kind of traveling along and then there's this big sign and you just have to go up this mountain and then just turn around and come back like why you need a hill repeat <laughs> on a course where I don't know what the elevation was over that whole thing you know like 65 some thousand million <laughs> <laughs> there's a hill repeat that you have to do 10 times because you have oh, to do it both directions <laughs> right oh my god it, it's so soul crushing i don't know if going <laughs> up it or coming down it is worse i really don't know <laughs> <laughs> oh. and you know this just happened here in in january um whether it could be anything there what what did it look like for you guys so the first part of the first half of the race i would almost say it was a little too warm i mean i was in shorts i um i was in a tank top for some of it and uh, i noticed my heart rate was a little high on the first lap now i was excited and probably moving maybe a little faster than i should have but i think the heat added and i don't mean like heat i mean maybe it hit 65 70 but you know when you're used to the cold that kind of switch quickly you know you kind of feel it and then all of a sudden in like the last 24 well it, it the weather really came in when sarah started crewing me on the way back and Oh, Sarah, so amazing. Um, <laughs> it's we were in shorts still because it had been warm and just like the hail and the rain <laughs> and this huge downpour just oh, dropped man. on us. I don't know, Sarah, we were in the last four miles, three miles. I'm not sure. Yeah, three miles. Yeah, which 
thank God it was three miles to the cabin and, and Shanoa who was out on the course, like in the middle of the course had was like, you know, without real good shelter. But, um, that started the, the interesting weather. I, I came into the cabin and I was almost in tears oh. <laughs> and it was, it was a mix of I'm so cold and poor Shanoa, how is she handling this? Oh. <laughs> Um, but after that it just it got cold and then it got really windy mm. really windy 50 mile an hour winds and there was wow. snow on the ground um i think the hardest part of it all my waterproof socks were not waterproof <laughs> <laughs> that's the worst <laughs> the snow kept melting on my shoes and it oh, would make my yeah. feet so cold oh, I, I honestly think i had a little bit of frost snip because for about a week afterward my feet and toes they Tingle. burned in yeah. weird ways all the time <laughs> oh god we also put 215 miles on them so they yeah, there's that yeah, <laughs> that, <again. laughs> that could have been part of it yeah, we, but i you know i want to say part of what i love about the duncan ridge trail in this course is it's really not very rocky and after um the at I don't want to curse on this podcast, so I won't. But <laughs> after dealing with the mm, 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 rocks, <laughs> my feet actually don't hurt. But um, it, it amazes me. Like every day at the end of the AT, you know, we would put in between 12 and like 18 hour days was our longest day on the AT. My feet just throbbed. I mean, throbbed. <laughs> and, I, and I really think it's just the rocks and all the pounding where yeah. on the Duncan Ridge Trail, it's like, you know, nice. And, I mean, there's some rocks, but. Right. Nothing, nothing compared yeah. to the AT. Right. right. Um, we're going to bounce around a little bit because uh, so many questions came up, but how many um, starters were there for the race? Well, there were three crazies. Three crazies. Okay. Uh, there were two <laughs> finishers. So um, I'm, I'm guessing looking at the results, um, Shinoa did not. Okay. No, I, I think the rain, I think it was the rainstorm, to be mm -hmm. honest. Gotcha. She, yeah. Yeah, I was really hopeful for the. You yeah. know, she finished another 200 this past year, and I can't remember which one it was. And so I really was like, oh, this is her year. Mm. But that getting caught in that rainstorm. And I mean, honestly, I, I don't even know how I would have handled that. It was really intense. I mean, yeah. to be yeah. out in the middle of nowhere. Right. Um, gosh, I think I, saw, I think I saw her out at Bigfoot. Um, so Yeah, I know she was at Bigfoot and she was at Tahoe. Um, gotcha. I'm trying to, I'd have to look it up on ultra sign up to see. Um, yeah. but anyway, um, man. So, um, how does that play into it? Knowing that there's only three people out on the course. I mean, you, you have experience with the AT in which it's, you know, in your mind, it's just you and potentially your friend that's with you. I mean, you know, there's other hikers out there, but you know, you're used to that kind of mindset where it's, it's, you know, not many people involved in the activity that you're in. Did that feel pretty normal to you? Just, you know, knowing that there's only like two other folks out on the course. <laughs> I mean, I knew it going into it. And, um, like you point out on the AT, so I was my friend that I was doing the AT with, she's a far stronger runner than I am. And so the way our days would work is we would have our quote unquote coffee hour. So we mm -hmm. would hike together for about well until the sun rose we usually started about 4 a.m and then once the sun would come up we'd give our hugs take a morning sunrise picture and she'd go take off running and i'd you know just kind of do my thing yeah. so I, in my mind i was prepared and ready for you know long miles by myself but as it turned out the other runner matthew he and i were pretty much evenly paced and um so we stuck together until oh, the nice. very very end at the very wow. end i I stopped to go to the bathroom and it was so miserable outside. He continued on and I never caught up with him, which I mean, I completely understand. I probably would have considered the same. It was so miserable, <laughs> uh, yeah, <right. laughs> but um, we, we really worked together. We, um, we stayed together the whole time. There were times when, you know, he, he was, a, he was a smarter, he's more experienced than I am. And so he, he pointed out, you know, this pace is a little fast. We've got a couple more laps to do. Let's let's hold back a little bit. So he held me back, which was smart. I was able to finish strong because of that. And I do really, really appreciate that. Um, um, <coughs> go ahead. I'm oh, and then uh, we would finish each lap. And as we were finishing, we would make a plan, like, how long are we going to rest? When are we going to meet the next morning? And so we did that every time. And um, mm. I... I think it was really good. It was a really good experience for me to do that this first round. I think if I ever do it again, I won't do that. But I think 
um, given the unknowns of a 200, it worked out well. Um, so speaking of, of that planning, um, did you have an initial plan and then kind of called an audible each time you got back to Vogel and just said, well, you know, I had planned on, but the reality is I probably should get this much rest or, you know, how did well, you, yeah. you know, amazingly I had a, I had a plan down to the hour. I, I told all my pacers, you know, you'll meet me at this time, at this place, this time, this time, and this place. <clears throat> and I did not get off track until the very last lap where I left one hour later than my planned time. So yeah. even though we were making adjustments for each other, it still timed out perfectly with the plan that I went in, which is probably why it was easy to stay yeah. together. Um, you were also ahead of schedule for a bit too. Yeah, 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 yeah. I got ahead of schedule in the first few laps, which I remember the first lap I, I came in about two hours faster than I had planned. I thought, oh, I've got some time for rest. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you have a, a crew chief? For this event yeah anna robbins was um, my crew chief and um mm -hmm. she, she did great like her my the biggest thing that i asked her to do was to be at the cabin i mean she was ready to go meet me at all the aid stations but um i mean i've crewed enough and volunteered enough the realities of five days of chasing someone around is just terrible <laughs> it, it's not a good plan and so i was like you know I, I really want you at the cabin you don't have to meet me at all these aid stations you know it, it's going to be fine <clears throat> And so that's what she did. And she created this assembly line. It was really great. You know, I walked in, she had the weather forecast written on a piece of card for me so I could decide my gear for the next loop. She completely repacked my pack each time she did. She charged my watch, you know, took care of all of that. Um, she forced me to sit down when I was kind of like stupidly walking around trying to remember my name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she was, she was really good. And then, um, I kind of, it's weird. I had this premonition because, you know, the weather and she has a cabin in Suches and I thought, gosh, what happens if she gets snowed in? Cause that's where she was predominantly staying when I wasn't at the cabin. So I made it so that all of my drop bags would sustain me regardless mm. if I had crew or not. And, you know, mm. sure enough, she got snowed in oh, wow. and she wasn't able to make it for the very last lap. But I mean, I had, um, Sarah was there, Richard who um, paced me the final 60 miles. And then I had two other friends, Austin and Katie, who came in <clears throat> and were able to help me in the last lap. Nice, nice. I mean, it's incredible. I had six people. <laughs> I don't think yeah. get this done. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. No, for the course of five days. So I don't know how I deserve this, but <laughs> six people were willing to give up their life <laughs> for a couple yeah. of days. Yeah, no, it, it takes a team. Yeah, I, I know that for sure. I had quite the team out at, at Bigfoot, so I understand that. Um, Sarah, as a as a pacer. Um, you know, talk about your experience. Um, what was it like if, uh, was Celia getting pretty tired and kind of silly <laughs> or how was she? I mentally? would say, so they, they always refer to going out the next morning. Um, uh, but that was usually like 5 PM or 7 PM. <laughs> it was just whatever it was when they were getting back from the cabin. Um, so I would say when we, it was definitely kind of a struggle in the nights, um, but it just kept moving, um, and the fog, you know, it, it made it so it wasn't really runnable at night. You really could see or the rain. Um, so, you know, I just tried to tell whatever stories I could and then just kind of, you know, I knew as soon as the sun came up, they'd be alive again. They were, they really weren't struggling. Um, they still had a great pace. I mean, even when we started off at night, we still made it um, from Vogel to Skeena in nine and a half hours, Nice, so, which is pretty. I mean, I think Celia's initial goal was to try to do eight hour laps yeah, or 15 hours. But I mean, it was a lot faster coming back than it was going out or as soon as the sun came up as well. So. And when you say they, you mean Matt and Celia? Yeah, correct? we always, yeah, since Matt and Celia were always together, which I think was a, a great plan because it, it just, it kind of, you know, it kept Matt with a, with people. So he wasn't, he was never alone, but it also kind of um, made a, a great little group and encouraged people along. Nice. So. Did Matt have, Matt have any pacers or crew or anybody? No, no. His, his wife was at the yeah, his wife was at the cabin helping him out. Um and his cat. 
I just can't get it. <laughs> you know, I, I took a tumble like at one point and Matt was the only one with me. And it was like, wow. <laughs> you know, it's like, this a little like a one or two roll down the mountain. I was totally fine. But, you know, in the dark and the fog and yeah. everything. And he turned around and like lifted me up off the trail and hugged me <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> for like 30 seconds. And he's like, don't do that again. <laughs> and I mean, in that moment, it was really nice to have someone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I like the sound of this, Matt. I haven't met Matt, but I like the sounds of him. <laughs> he, was, he was pretty awesome. That's pretty cool. Um, can you touch on, we, we've kind of talked a lot about, you know, all of these conditions. Can you talk about your, your gear a little bit? Was there anything that helps you in the fog? Um, did you have like a, a, a light belt or anything that give you that kind of low level light? Did you have anything like that? Yeah, I always run with a waist belt. I don't ever run with a headlamp. And, um, in hindsight, the light that I was using, I really liked it because it was, you know, AAA powered and it never went out. So I didn't have to worry about changing lights, but it really wasn't enough light. So mm. I, I need to work on that. I think if I had a little bit more lighting around my waist, the fog wouldn't have been as much of an issue. Um, what were you so using yeah. out of curiosity? Oh, I was like a $15 thing I got off Amazon. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't remember. I okay. don't know. Fair enough. Fair but, enough. But it lasted for 12 hours, which is <laughs> what was important to me. <laughs> right. You know, right. I have all the fancy waist belts that are super bright, but they only last four hours. And like the mental strain of having to remember to carry batteries and to switch them out. I just, I didn't, I would, I made the decision to go low light and I need to work on that a little bit more, but fair enough. And then um, I think the saving piece of um, gear that everybody told me would work. And I was kind of like, oh, I wonder about this Were my $10 frog togs. <laughs> You'll have to talk about those. I don't know what those are. <laughs> They're like one step above a trash bag. Okay. They're a trash bag that have zippers. <laughs> okay. You said they're called what? Frog togs. Like frog togs. F R O G G. I think T O G G. You can get them on Amazon or wherever. I'll have um, to check these out. <laughs> yes. Yes. I had a full set pants and jacket. I only wore the jacket. The pants are too annoying. Um, <laughs> pants and jacket at the uh, three of the aid stations. And um, when the wind came rolling in, I had my three hundred dollar wool jacket that I'd purchased, or my. Ten dollar frog tog, and I looked at them both, and I said, "I want that frog tog. <laughs> it's gonna block the wind." <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah. So I had a wool. I had, well, I had this really amazing wool shirt that has a hood that you know comes to like this. <laughs> it totally covers she, your she face. Has a, she has a, a ninja mask for those that are. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have, I have a that ninja are listening. Mask shirt, and like the best thing about it is like you never lose it. You know, the, the hood is there; it's attached. Yeah. I have a problem with losing things. So, <laughs> yeah, I had my never lose ninja, ninja mask attached to my shirt, and um, so that plus another windbreaker jacket plus the frog tog on top jacket, and you know I had little tights on on the bottom but i would say that was probably the crucial piece of gear that ten dollar frog tog <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, uh, uh going on in with gear can you talk about your footwear what did, what were you wearing for footwear i mean you said your your feet weren't bad um i'd like mm -hmm. to hear about you know what what you wore uh, socks and shoes that'd be great to hear well, I like the toe socks for, so I wore the Aninji wool toe socks until okay. it was raining. And then I switched to these, like whatever brand of waterproof socks I got off the internet, which not waterproof. <laughs> not so much. <laughs> not so much. Um, I started in Innovate, their um, 270 trail mm. shoes, which I really like this year. I feel like it's a zippy shoe. Um, I feel like I can move pretty quickly in it, but it was giving me lace bite on the top of my foot. And mm. so like the last four-ish miles of the first 40 mile loop I was in so much pain so I had to switch those out and I, never in a million years did I think this would happen but like right before I left I was struggling with shoe decisions and my coach said why don't you just wear the shoes you wore for your hundred and I thought to myself well I, I, I ran 100 miles in them and I trained in them like they're dead they have nothing <laughs> left in them but I just tossed them in my bag like I don't know maybe and sure enough that's what I wore my Topo okay. Ultra Venture 2s for yeah. the rest of the run, and I didn't have any feet problems. Yeah. I have the I have the three, which I don't like, so I'm now on a crusade to buy every single two I can 
<laughs> we all know how that goes. <laughs> you put on your ultras after the pouring rain, didn't you? Oh, yeah, I did. I put on my ultra lone peaks for 20 miles, but they were bothering the tops of my feet, too. That's right. Mm. You right there. I forgot about mm. that. Um, how did you find, just out of curiosity, um, the lone peaks when it was wet? You know, the new lone peaks... I have, a, I have a lot of hope for like they were yeah. they're grippier right then because right. i have the sevens from the six they're grippier so and you I were in the new ones for 20 miles and, yeah. and they felt pretty you noticed a significant difference on the traction i haven't tried them in wet yet so i was just curious yeah but again there's no rocks so i mean mm, right. i'm sure. not sure on slippery rocks how yep. they would work Fair but enough. um you know i did actually really i was i'm so hopeful for them but the tongue is a little different and they were irritating the top of my foot as well oh. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, you mentioned earlier that you were seeing that your heart rate was rising. Were you paying internal attention or was that something you were monitoring on your watch? My coach is a really strict heart rate monitor <laughs> training person. And so gotcha. I had very, very strict, not strict, but I had, you know, guidelines that she wanted me to follow. And um, I really, I wanted to follow them and I did my best to follow them, but like on the climbs, she, she gave me such a good taper. I was in such good shape. I was so ready for this race. I was nice. like a racehorse, just like <laughs> dying. <laughs> and so holding back and staying at heart rate on the climbs is a real struggle for me, for sure. But um, like in the average, I, I met the parameters, but the, the speed, you know, there were a lot of spikes on mm. the climbs that um were not in the plan. Nah. But then after, after the first lap, the monitor was chafing me so mm. bad that I just took it off. And I, I was going to ask about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, who, uh, who is your coach? Um, Don Lindsay. Okay, cool. I just want to give her a shout out for, for yeah, doing so much yeah. good work for you. Um, that's fantastic. Incredible. That's cool. Um, do you think she would mind if we talk a little bit about your training? Yeah, I think not. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, if you want to just give us like, I'm sure people are curious, what did in general, you don't have to get to specifics, but what did yeah. that look like? What are some things that you included? Um, you know, you could talk about like your volume. Um, how did you compensate for like the hiking you'd be doing? Um, did you do a specific type of workouts, anything like that? I'm going to just take you through a little history to answer this question. Um, <laughs> I hired Don when I was about midway through my first year on the AT and I was just like in this downward spiral. I don't know if it's like overtraining or under recovering or whatever, however you want to call it, but I was really struggling. I mean, I, you, you can see my resume. I had done a 50 mile race and I had done scar. So I had done a 72 mile adventure. And then here I was taking on this AT with, you know, an average of like 45 miles a day for three to five days. <laughs> like I really, was pretty inexperienced to do this. And so the thing that I like the most about my coach in my mind, and I think she would agree, um, she prioritizes recovery <laughs> <laughs> over training. And that's what I needed more than anything. I needed someone to help me recover. I already had a tough enough schedule with my AT plans. And, and she, I mean, I hired her to coach me through the AT. So I don't know if it's something she would have wanted me to do or would have had me do in training, but that that was the schedule and that was the plan. And so she helped me navigate that for the two, well, I guess a year and a half or whatever, you know, for the full year, well, the half a year from when I hired her and then the next year, which my AT experience ended in July. So at the end of July, I had um, seven days on the AT where I was averaging 14 to 18 hour days. I was like destroyed by the end of that. And so we really worked hard on recovering and, and then I threw her a curveball. I said, you know, I've never done a hundred mile race. I, I kind of want to know what that feels like. And then I kind of want to buckle. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's smart because, you know, Fierce Dragon all along had been my A race. And she's like, all right, we'll figure it out. <laughs> and so, you know, she got me ready for the hundred miler. And then after that, it was, it was just like a lot of recovery to get me ready for fierce drag. I mean, I did miles for sure. And the, and the hundred miler was the uh, mountaineer rumble. Mm -hmm. right. And I, and I have to tell you, I mean, I didn't really realize it at the time, but doing that was probably like the best thing that I could have done. Everything went wrong. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <At> that race. <laughs> and so I was really prepared. 
Mr. Hagen. <laughs> right on. Uh, so valuable lessons were learned at, at Mountaineer Rumble. What, what were some of those lessons? Well, I, I went into it. I think I had the flu. So that kind of okay. set the stage. Like two hours before the race, I had diarrhea. All right. <laughs> and that didn't stop. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> Um, so I dealt with that. Um, it rained like the entire time. It was the hottest day of like that they've ever had for that race. So, you know, a November race hitting 80 degrees, pretty miserable. Yeah. Um, I had horrible chasing, um, yeah. the diarrhea. I don't even know if you want to know what that was like. And <laughs> <laughs> I think we've all experienced it at some point. <laughs> How that affected things. <laughs> My heart rate was through the roof. Like I could not get it to settle. Mm. Um, I got to, I, I, I experienced for the first time in my life, the pain cave. There were like three hours where I wanted nothing more than to just die <laughs> <laughs> and end the misery. Oh my God. I, I, I got to the aid station during, you know, in the middle of this pain cave experience, I laid down on the ground. I took my shoes off. I took my heart rate monitor off. I turned off my watch, like the real <laughs> sign that a runner is done. I stopped my watch. <laughs> And um, I laid there and said, I'm done. I'm done. I'm not moving. And and my crew, they wouldn't let me quit. They're like, no, you have time. You have, you're you not on cutoffs. You have time. <laughs> <laughs> they forced me to get up <laughs> and keep moving. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Awful. They threatened to call my kids. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's that a good way to get you moving. Ever. If you don't move, I'm going to, my, my kids are tough on me. Like they're <laughs> tough. They, they will not tolerate a quitter. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But having that experience and um, like I was prepared and I was waiting, I kept waiting all through Fierce Dragon for the ball to fall. I kept waiting for the pain cave. I kept waiting for that misery. It never came, but I think because I was ready for it, uh, I don't know. It just, that's awesome. I think it made it easier. Yeah. Definitely. And you made it through, you know, I mean, that's incredible. Yeah, that got you got to finish. Yeah. You got your <laughs> buckle after all that, you know, that's, that's pretty incredible. Um, man, holy cow. Um, in your, in your preparations, when you were between the rumble and uh fierce dragon in your planning process, uh, what did you do to include your crew and pacers? How did you plan or disseminate your plan with them? Well, I actually spent a lot of time on trail with Anna. We, we did a couple of hikes together. And then um, Mitchell, another one of my pacers, he and I did a bunch of runs and hikes out on the DRT together. And so I was constantly talking about my plan to them personally on the hikes. Um, <clears throat> Sarah and I, we chat a lot. So she kind of had an idea of that. But actually, Anna had a great idea. She wanted to do a Zoom call with everybody involved. And so we did that. And my coach actually attended it as well. So that was really pretty cool. And um, I talked through my plan. I had, Anna encouraged me to have a lot of checklists, which my coach did as well. And so everything was written in bulleted form, you know, steps one through 10. This is what to ask me, what to do at the aid stations, at the cabin. This is the timing, you know, I'm going to meet you at 8 a.m. Skina, you know, everything was really clearly laid out. And I was able to do that because I knew the Duncan Ridge Trail so well. It was probably, Sarah, you can remember like a year and a half ago that we did our, I did, she showed me the Duncan Ridge Trail. We did an out yeah. and back. And so I, I really had a real good idea of the trail and what I could do on it, what paces were comfortable. And so I could be very detailed. Nice. Nice. And Sarah, um, from these conversations, um, what did you bring into fierce dragon strategies wise, like, you know, to, to keep the atmosphere light and positive, um, you've, you seem to have a lot of experience with volunteering and crewing and, um, pacing even. So, uh, what did you try to bring to the table for Celia? I mean, Celia was 100% ready for this. She really, <laughs> you know, she needed us to be there, but not really. Um, <laughs> so I just knew like I had to make sure that she was eating um, at the aid stations like she had a plan of all these bars and stuff that she was going to consume along the way. But of course, you know, after so many hours, you can't really chew a bar anymore. So um, just knowing what types of food that she could eat. Um, so rolling into an aid station, I'd be like, all right, they have this. And like that actually sounds good to her. So just shove that in her face and, and you know, just 
try to keep her calories up, um, you know, just motivate her with, you know, the sun's almost out, um, <laughs> try to, we know the trail so well that it's like, all right, we just have to get to here. And then, you know, we're almost to this point or so, right on. but she, she had it herself. She can, <laughs> She can power hike like nobody I've ever seen in my life. Like <laughs> anytime we hit a climb, um, I mean, I was fortunate. I caught her at a hundred miles in, so I was able to keep up with her or keep ahead of her. But anytime, like if she's on fresh legs, like we hit a climb, I'm like, I'll see you on the downhill. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> so she's just, she's got it. That's awesome. Um, so Celia, a lot of times, um, in something that's so grand, like a 215 mile race, we try to segment, right. We try to break it up. Did that, did you break it up by lap? How did you break it up? Let's just go with that. <laughs> by the way, thank you for saying 215. <laughs> that was a nice, I like that. Um, and yeah, it was definitely five 43 mile training runs for me. That's how I viewed the race for sure. Right on. Yeah, that's I mean, and in those those earlier, were you able to stay in the moment? I mean, that's the hardest thing, right? Is just not going beyond the lap you're on. So were you able to do that? And if so, what were some strategies you used to do so? Well, the AT entirely trained me for that. Oh yeah. Entire, yeah, yeah. I mean, when we would start out on the AT, there were days where I would hop a flight, arrive, take an Uber to the trail, hit the trail at eight PM and know that I had 150, 170 miles in front of me and it was 8 PM on a Friday. Right. <laughs> so like, I would just tell myself, all right, we got 20 miles tonight and then we sleep. And then, and I would just always take it one day at a time because every day was so different on the AT. And so I brought that experience to Fierce Dragon and I just nice. was, it was, I actually never, I didn't, I couldn't even keep up with the miles to be honest with you. I, I really never thought, Oh, I'm at mile. 160 or whatever. It, it just never crossed my mind. I was always on lap one, lap two, mm -hmm. lap three. Lap three. Cool. It, it made it a lot easier. And that, I guess that would, um, you know, like Bigfoot was point to point. So, you know, you kind of were caught up in, well, I'm between mile and mile. So like you knew where you were, that was the hard thing. Um, but yeah, if you can, you know, mentally change it to, I'm in a lap, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, well, and what helps with that is you, you come back to the cabin and, mm -hmm. and although, you know, my day, as Sarah pointed out, often started at 5 PM <laughs> or 9 PM or whatever, it, it still was a complete reset. And that made it a lot, lot easier to do yeah. that. Right. So, um, one of the biggest questions I always get asked, of course, is like, did you sleep? <laughs> um, what did that look like for you? You know, I, I wanted to sleep and I gave myself every opportunity to sleep. <laughs> I, I rested at the cabin, I would say between three and there is even one five hour stretch, I think, but definitely between three and four hours every time. And um, in that period of time, at least two of those hours I spent in bed with like a face mask, you know, shades, closed, really comfortable. I, I brought my favorite blanket from home, you know, <laughs> I did everything I could and I would just lay there and I. I did a lot of breathing, you know, in for four, out for six to try and really calm down the nervous system and relax. But I don't know. I don't know <laughs> about actual sleep. I think maybe 20 or 40 minutes each time I okay. actually slept. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. I always, it, you know, before, before doing this, I read a book, um, Jennifer Farr Davis, and I can't remember the name pursuit of endurance. I think it is Sarah. I sent you that mm -hmm. book. Um, in it, Warren Doyle, who is like the AT guru and somebody else also, I don't remember who they both talk about how sleep is an emotional need and you know, it's more for your brain than for your body. So I think just laying there for two hours, eyes closed, relaxing was enough to trick my brain into thinking I had gotten enough sleep because I, I mean, I definitely felt tired on the, in the, you know, I was, was kind of draggy when it was dark out, but I never felt like I had to lay down on the trail and sleep like that thought never crossed my mind. That's impressive. <laughs> yeah, That is impressive. Oh man. 
I, I had so many times where my eyes were like closing on the trail and I'm still like walking and I'm like, whoa, <laughs> you know, <laughs> need well, to you, pro- you, you probably didn't take three hour breaks every 43 miles. No, <laughs> no, I, I didn't. That's, that's, that is a difference for sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and I'll, I'll say in hindsight, like it, it, when I do this race again, <laughs> can I say that? I, mean, I won't, yeah. I'm, I want to challenge myself a little bit because I honestly feel like I had more of an adventure than a 200 mile race, which is amazing. And it was, is my first one. And I'm, I'm so glad I did it this way. But, um, I think if I were to do it again, I want to, I want to have that race feeling and yeah. see what it's like to do it in a way that maybe you did yours. Well, <laughs> I mean, it, that was punishment. I'll be honest. Like <laughs> it was, I'll find the pain cave again. <laughs> it, it was brutal. <laughs> It was brutal. Like, you know, it, it quickly escapes your mind, you know, because then you start thinking about like, just like you just said, when I do it again, but I, it's not that I'm going to do Bigfoot again. It's, you know, if I do, it would be like Tour de Jean or something like that. But, oh my gosh, like, you know, it, like when I talk to others that have done 200 milers and the things you go through, which you had an amazing experience. I mean, it sounds like everything was on point for you, you know, from start to finish it's that's incredible i mean you know uh, maybe you had some some gear flaws like your lighting and your you know um non-waterproof socks um but you know on the whole it sounds like it was you know it was a good day um it, 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 something to touch on did you, you use poles oh yeah yeah oh, yeah. yeah what yeah. what poles do you use you know this is really cool a friend of mine bought me a new pair for christmas Aww. um and they were, they're the black diamond. They're not collapsible, but mm-hmm. they're super light, super, super light. And they were incredible. Nice. They were absolutely nice. Incredible. Yeah. Did that ever get cumbersome? Not a, being able to collapse? You were pretty used no. to them. Yeah. No, I, you know, I, I used them all through the AT. And so I'm, I'm, it's pretty easy for me just to put them in one hand and jog with them or to even jog with them. Yeah. And what pack did you use out of curiosity? Um, Solomon, um, it's the, the 12th. Yeah. 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 That it seems to be the, the pack of choice. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It is a great pack for, you know, long, long races, mountain races. It's like when you need to stuff gear, that thing is wonderful. So yeah. I agree. You know, on the AT, I used it as well. I was able to fit a pad, a liner, a sleeping wow. bag. Jeez. We would self support for a day. So 40, yeah. 50 miles worth of food. <laughs> <laughs> filter lighting i mean you would not believe what i was able to get in that pack that is incredible yeah mm-hmm. my my kids say i look like the humpback of notre dame you know like yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like stuff to the hilt uh, that's so cool um so um man i mean geez we've talked so much about like the race and um that last you said you had um i think it was richard right it was your last pacer yeah and, uh sarah were you the second to last pacer yeah, I had her for 100 to 140-ish. So 140-ish. Um, when you were coming towards the end of that 140, Sarah, um, what did you see in Celia? Like, how did you portray it? Did you know she was going to be able to get to the finish? Uh, how was oh, yeah, it? I never you... had a doubt. <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, you know, it, it's it sometimes it's tough for a pacer to – to leave the runner what uh, what were you feeling when you had a step off the course yeah it was it was definitely hard I, I left her at Skeena um with Richard and they were going into the the night and the cold and um so it's like I wanted to be there with them but also I knew what weather was coming so <laughs> I'm like, ah, well, I'll just see her back at the cabin where it's nice and warm <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but yeah, it was, it was definitely tough to to send them on their way without uh, wishing I was out there too. But I understand. She tried to not um, get me to do the last twenty miles because it was cold and raining, and Aww. like you can't take this adventure from me. I'm like I'm I'm here for it. So that's awesome. But, yeah, I, I felt bad for my pacers having to deal with this <laughs> awful weather. <laughs> but that's what fierce I mean, fierce dragon, you get all the weather every year. So Right. Yeah. yeah. I I think the everybody knows what they're kind of getting into. Um, mm-hmm. for the most part. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll, just, I'll give a little entertaining bit. Sarah actually missed the um I did break down a little bit. So in the last lap when I hit Skeena, so you know. 100, 180 but you know not because of the extra mileage whatever miles 
I was so, de- it had gotten so cold that I wasn't eating on trail anymore. I mean, I'd kind of stopped eating on trail anyway, just because chewing and whatnot, but everything was frozen. <laughs> and so even gels were kind of out of the question. I couldn't take my mittens off my hands because it was so cold. And so I got into Skeena and um, I was so depleted. I've never experienced this before, but um, Matthew said something that kind of ir- irritated me. And so <laughs> I, um, he said something bad about himself and I, no. and I just, I was like, I'm not in the space to build you up. Which right he has now. been <laughs> doing for the past 180 miles. He right, right, yeah. And so I was talking about a clumsy little fart he was. Right, right, right. I think he said something even worse. And so I yelled at him. <laughs> I like you, and I want you to stop putting yourself down. <laughs> and then I started crying, and then I started laughing, and then I went back to crying and laughing. I, mean, I was just a complete mess. And, um, Austin and Katie were with me and Austin said, will you eat a corn chip, please? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, yeah. I did experience a little bit of a breakdown. <laughs> they happen. They happen. Yeah. I, I, I remember mine. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you've got Richard on your last leg here. Uh, you said that's 60 miles he had with you, which yeah. is, you know, that's an incredible stretch for a pacer. I know. Yeah. That's, that's pretty cool. Um, it was a big ask. I guess. Well, I mean, it sounds like, you know, you picked the right person and <laughs> I'm sure Sarah could have done it as well, but, um, you know, coming in with, with Richard, um, you know, you're on your last lap now, uh, we're, we're on the final lap, um, you know, talk about your uh you, you know well let's even go for the way back so you hit skiing and you're on your way back talk about where you are mentally and you know what's what's going through your mind um what's what's richard saying to you <laughs> you know i, I ran into skiing actually and um sarah was right there behind me and i got there and i was like richard i'm a hot mess <laughs> he's like oh it's my favorite kind and he's like what do you need and i was like i need lots of food and so i really tanked up at Skeena and then we took off and getting back to the cabin we just we just held like a steady comfortable pace but I was getting really excited like I was starting to smell the barn door and I wanted to run and I kept saying nope you're hiking you're not running you've got another lap to do this feels like the finish but it's not the finish nope hold back hold back and you know Richard was pacing like a pretty comfortable hiking pace and so we got back to the cabin and um you know, did our turn around our rest and this and that. And we took off and I was still, I was just feeling so much fire. Like, oh my God, I'm going to finish this. This is incredible. So we were pacing pretty fast. Um, Richard, he, he was slowing me down on the climbs, but speeding me up on the downs and the flats, which was kind of a good learning experience for me. Cause I tend to do the opposite. I love to power up the climbs and then recover on the way down. But I think actually his way of doing it is probably easier on the body and it's just as fast. So we were pacing about a 15 hour lap, which would have been my, probably my second fastest lap of the whole, um, you know, race, but the cold, and then I got into Skeena and that depleted state and, you know, my body just, you know, took a dive from there. And I spent like 40 minutes at Skeena trying to refuel and stop crying. (laughs) (laughs) And I, I don't know if it was the the calorie dump. I mean, I think I took in close to a thousand calories at Skeena and a lot of it was um, coconut oil mixed with broth, Mm. which went down really easy, but it wasn't the broth that I was used to. It was a different brand and from Skeena to Mulkey, which I don't know, it's like maybe eight or nine miles. I can't remember. I was burping (laughs) 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 and getting really nauseous and I I got in I got into Mulkey and I was like and Austin was there I was like Austin I'm a mess I need you to melt two chocolate bars (laughs) and I'm gonna drink them (laughs) 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 so I drank my chocolate bars and um we took off and then that's that's kind of when like my body was really like and like diarrhea started coming and I was my fire had totally blown out because of the nausea I didn't even go into fire pit I told Richard I said if I go in I'm not coming out so let's just skip fire pit Uh, you know just just get home just get this done yeah but he was great he was incredible he I I told him on the zoom call 
I want you to talk. I want to know your entire life story. And let me tell you, if you ever have a chance for him to pace you, you ask that exact same question because you will not be disappointed. <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Sarah, did she give you any instructions? I mean, I told as many stories as I could, but um, other than that, it was just, just her main direction was just get her on pace and we stuck to it. So I'm right on. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I did. I did fall. I did fall once with Sarah. I fell right into a briar patch. <laughs> I'm, I'm seeing a trend here. <laughs> it, was it was. It was the third lap, and I think. I think the third lap was the hardest. It was for my everyone. Fault. Um, it was they both seemed like they they were struggling a good bit, but they definitely did a 180. So. Right on. And Sarah, did you meet them anywhere to come into the finish? No, I actually, I had to get back to Athens that day, so I couldn't see the finish. So I was just, okay. you know, refreshing my phone every <laughs> two seconds, <laughs> trying to wait for updates. Um, How were updates coming? Just, we had a group text going. Okay. Um, so since Austin and Katie were there, um, and then... I, I did at one point like pester Perry. I'm like, I know you're super busy, but like, yeah. she should be almost there. <laughs> um, so you're coming in now, Celia. What uh, what time of day or night are you coming in? Um, my, well, my goal was to finish at 8 a.m. on Saturday, and I think I actually finished at 10:30 on okay. Saturday. So it's it's morning time. So you're coming in. <laughs> you start to see the the campsites talk about that moment well it was kind of funny uh, actually what I'll, I'll tell you just a little bit so the final climb is kusa and um richard looked at me and he's like even though you're on 190 miles you're going to climb this faster than me right now so you go on so <laughs> i climbed kusa alone and i got to the top and i was like well i wonder where he is well i'll just kind of mosey on down and he'll catch me because he's way faster on the downs than i was at that point and then like i had to pull over go to the bathroom and i'm sitting there you know having diarrhea and he pops up right behind me. <laughs> He's like, oh, there you are. <laughs> so, you know, we got a good laugh about that and um, <laughs> continued on for the remaining six miles. But as we were, so, you know, Perry's races are so bare bones in some ways. And we, we, we pull into the campsite and I'm like, I wonder where the finish is. <laughs> <laughs> one of us knew <laughs> do we go to cabin nine or you know, where do we go and i was like well maybe we'll just go on to the pavilion and see if anybody's there and you know as we got closer to the pavilion i could hear people cheering and <laughs> yeah that's when i started running again so i got fun for the finish <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh see so, you know, one thing i never i forgot to ask you but um was it uplifting when the 100 miler and the 40 miler started like seeing them out on the trail Oh my God, that was incredible. That was so incredible. And actually you guys probably know Jason Martin. I know Sarah does, but um, Jason Martin was out there, you know, in the dark right around the same time I was. And I don't know if it was 2 a.m., 4 a.m. or whatever, but it was dark and it was cold and it was windy. And we were climbing up this mountain and I don't remember if I came up to him or he came up to me, but, you know, we crossed paths and he looked at me and he said, you more than anybody deserves this finish. The amount that you volunteer with your kids for these races, I'm really rooting for you. And like, <laughs> I could have cried. I probably did cry <laughs> <laughs> when he said that to me. It was it was really incredible. But yeah, seeing everybody was was really awesome. Oh, very cool, um, Sarah. Any other questions or or final thoughts that you'd like to to say? Oh, I got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, well, Celia, how about you? Any any final thoughts? Um, you know, when you look back at the event. What's your most lasting memory? Mm, oh my gosh. I, I think just in general, how so many people were willing to help me. I mean, that's, that's really incredible. Oh, yeah. Would you like to give a few thank yous? Yeah. Um, all of it, Sarah, Richard, my coach, Anna, Austin, Katie, Perry, all the volunteers, I, the volunteers at um, Mulkey, 
they were just amazing. Like they somehow knew what I wanted. Like I would walk into the aid station and they're like, here's your peeled orange and corn chips that you've been eating. Oh, I was texting them. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. (laughs) (laughs) I felt like royalty, you know? Oh, Oh, you were. They do exactly what you wanted all the time. So what I'm hearing is the uh, the fire pit volunteers need to step up their game a little bit more. So, <laughs> well, because <laughs> you just skipped that one. No, no, they were great too. They were absolutely great. You know, fire pit. You come out of it. You get to it when you're pretty fresh. So it's not like that <gasps> feeling right, so much. Right. Yeah. 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 No, the fire pit was amazing too. They actually, I, I was eating the chicken breast, and like I guess they, they ran out, and so they made Perry buy more chicken breasts for me. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Celia, I mean, I love, you know, just the joy that you have. And yeah, I can tell this experience meant so much. Uh, it's really just awesome. Just the positivity that exudes from this conversation and, and your, your experience. So congratulations, um, thank Sarah. You. Thank you for, for joining us as well. And for helping uh, Celia get through this journey. Um, it was, uh, it was awesome. Super awesome. It was a fun conversation. So thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, thank you, Celia and Sarah, and congratulations one more time (laughs) to Cecilia. Um, You know, I have uh, I have both of their um, their connections, uh, Facebook and Instagram. And if you want to connect with either of them, uh, you can send them requests. Um, The show notes will have uh, how you can connect with them either on Facebook or Instagram. Um, Truly awesome people. So thank you to both of them. Uh, Sarah herself will be um, going after the Foothills Trail uh, in just a few weeks time. So uh, I wish Sarah the best of luck. Sarah is one of my athletes that I train. Um, She is trying to do the Brute Challenge, the Blue Ridge Ultra Trail Endurance Challenge. Uh, And uh, I've talked about this in previous podcasts. Uh, I had the creator Charles on. Uh, Natalie Daniels went after it. Uh, she she finished the brute challenge, so uh, you can check that out in previous podcast episodes. So some pretty cool stuff. Um, both amazing humans. So uh, once again, thank you to both of them for coming on. Uh, in my world here, MR Running Pains, um, it is. The beginning of February, so newsletter will be coming out. I'm going to probably be a little bit late on this one. Track season is kind of winding down, so um, we have a lot going on with the state meet coming up. So I've been really focused on those athletes. Um, we're having like multiple meets per week, so my time has just been extremely limited between um, coaching the track athletes, uh, coaching my regular athletes, and just trying to keep up with my family and their activities. So and my own training. So uh, I apologize for the delay, but the newsletter will be coming out here within uh, the next few days. So I hope to have that out by um, the weekend. So um, please stay tuned for the newsletter. If you'd like to subscribe, you can go to my website, mrrunningpains.com and subscribe. It's a free newsletter. It comes out once a month with all sorts of training tips, gear reviews, um, music suggestions, uh, you know, just... Whew, Lot, I try to jam pack it with information. Um, I've got a lot of good articles that I'm trying to write for, for this um, newsletter, which is why it's taking me a little bit longer. Uh, just a lot of ideas popped into my mind. Um, so I'm, I'm going to really try to get this ironed out and, and out to you guys as fast as I can. So thank you for your patience. Um, Otherwise, uh, my training, whew, man, um, Patrick Regan, my coach, has me ramping back up. I've been getting my mileage back up into the 70s. My treadmill broke. I had a brand new Nordic Track commercial grade treadmill, and it broke. I couldn't believe it. Um, so uh, while waiting for the repair, we have been using the weighted vest and getting more efficient at my hiking speeds. Um, I did two miles on the track yesterday in about 24 minutes. So, um, you know, power hiking is really coming around. I'm using a 20 pound weighted vest, um, in order to kind of replicate, uh, what I would be doing at incline on the treadmill. But, um, yeah, like I said, um, I'm really starting to feel really strong with my power hiking and with the mileage bump up, my fitness is coming back around. I'm noticing my, uh, my pace is really dropping. Um, I've been really cognizant about my recovery paces, trying to keep the heart rate super low. Um, actually my recovery runs, I've been staying zone one, which is a real, real shuffle, 
Um, you know, I've been hitting probably, well, I started I was in, in the 12 minutes uh, with the training. I'm now down into the 11 minute range for my shuffle in, in uh, zone one. So um, zone one training, like I said, getting better. Zone two, zone three, they're all improving. I'm getting faster um, in my other zones because I'm just taking my recovery days super easy and focusing on making sure that I'm hitting the prescribed um, heart rate zones. Um, got a big workout today after I record this. Um, I've got, uh, uh, the yellow gap road is kind of the main climb that I've been using in my training. It's about a three mile climb ish, about 1500 feet of gain. And, uh, I've done one workout on it, but, uh, today I have a 40 minute tempo. So, uh, you know, going to do the climb and, you know, try to stay, uh, kind of moderate heart rate. Uh, so do the climb and then descend, you know, uh, pretty fast. And then if I have any time left, I'll start climbing again. So, um, you know, really working a lot of the up down, we've been doing a lot of strides. Patrick's has me doing, um, all variations of stride, flat, uphill, downhill, um, uh, really varying it up, kind of getting ready for Western States. Uh, the Wasatch lottery just happened. And that is of course the last race in the grand slam. I did not get in through the lottery. So I have a provisional entry, which means that I have to finish three of the races prior to Wasatch, complete my uh, volunteer hours, and um, and then I can uh, I'll be I'll be entered into Wasatch. So um, congrats to uh, to the other athletes that got in. I know my friend Shannon. She she lives not but a mile from my house. Uh, she got in, which I'm excited for her. Uh, I can't wait to see her out there. Um, Tom. Uh, Thomas, Thomas, uh, he's doing the grand slam and I'm coaching him. I saw he got in, so that's awesome. Um, really cool stuff going on. Um, excited also my friend Pete Rittmaster. Uh, if you know, Pete, Pete finished the Iditarod, a uh, thousand plus mile adventure up in Alaska. Uh, Pete got into Vermont, so I can't wait to see him up there. Uh, I keep hearing of, of a number of people that got into Western States, so it's going to be fun to see everybody out there. I'm super excited for the summer. Uh, it's, it's not hard to get out and train right now. Um, although Sunday was pretty tough. I had to get up at four in order to squeeze it in before my family activities. So got up at four, I ran 20 miles, ran up to the Blue Ridge Parkway over into Bent Creek and then back. So got about 10 miles out, 10 miles back. So longest run yet, 20 miles and feeling pretty good. Uh, my next race is April 1st. I'll be racing the Rim Runner 50 miler. Um, I'm hoping my, my really good friend, Nathan Franz, who is just on the podcast, um, he's uh, looking at doing potentially the 50 miler as well. So I might have a friend out there um, doing that in prep for Western States, obviously, but I also need it as a qualifier for Vermont 100. So I, can, I really look forward to doing that on April 1st. I, I am hearing from the Trail, pa, Trail Trash podcast that those guys are going to be out there. So um, look forward to seeing those guys. They came out to Hellbender. I didn't realize who they were at the time, but I heard them talking on the podcast about crewing at Hellbender. And I actually talked with them because they were waiting on their, their runner who actually is one of the guys that I coach as well. Um, so look forward to meeting those guys uh, and, uh, and hopefully – Sharing, uh, sharing some miles if we can. Um, so some exciting stuff coming up. Um, as far as coaching goes at this time, I am full. <laughs> um, I, I said it in previous podcasts, but I keep getting requests. Um, so I'm trying to disseminate it best I can. Um, I am full for now. Uh, if you'd like to talk about, you know, jumping on board for a fall event, if you would like to reserve a spot, um, you know, as, as long as things open up, then, uh, you know, please let's have that conversation. So, um, I know you're interested. Um, but again, you know, as of right now, I'm, I'm pretty booked up. <laughs> so I, again, thank you guys for, for reaching out. But, um, at this time I can't take on anybody new right now, but if you want to reserve a spot for the fall, please do so. I encourage you to do so. Um, other than that, my friends, I hope you are doing great. If you do have any questions or uh, suggestions for the podcast, just let me know. Drop me a line in any of the you know any of the ways that are in the show notes. Uh, you can do through through a comment through Strava. Um, reach out to me on any of my social media platforms, my email, my website. Uh, happy to hear from you. As I said, this was a listener suggested podcast and I was thrilled that, uh, that they gave, um, me this idea. So thank you, Nancy, once again. Uh, and, 
Um, got some some interesting guests lined up coming up. Um, Miriam Saloom, uh, my my resident PT, <laughs> she's going to come back on and actually talk about uh, two injuries that uh, you know were kind of related, and uh, it's a, they're very common injuries and how she overcame them. Uh, and, and what she did to, to compound the problem, which led to the second injury. So um, it's, it's going to be great to hear that, you know, coming from a physical therapist. So I look forward to that conversation with Miriam. Um, and, you know, like I said, I've got other guests that um, I have lined up ideas for. So going to keep trying. Uh, and I love hearing your ideas, too. So don't hesitate to reach out. Or if you had feedback, please, you know, please let me know. Uh, as always, thank you to my Patreon supporters. If you are uh, able to support me on Patreon, links in the show notes, as well as on my website, I certainly appreciate the support. helps me keep doing all of this, keep the podcast going, the YouTube videos, and the newsletter. I really do appreciate the support of all my Patreon supporters, and if you can support too, thank you so much. So I'm going to sign off for now, uh, but until next time, you guys keep running, my friends.